Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's a uh, pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome Jean-Francois Belanger um, from uh, the International Security Studies uh, Program uh, at uh, Yale University, where he is a postdoctoral fellow. Um, his uh, degrees, as you know from the, uh, um, from, uh, the outline, uh, are from Concordia uh, and Dalhousie uh, and uh, from McGill. And uh, so today he's going to talk to us about counterproliferation uh, and deterrence, uh, and in particular, as you can see, uh, um, why competence matters. And so without further ado, Jean-Francois. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking Kim for the uh, invitation to talk here today. Stephanie from being the go-between initially uh, and Maureen for taking care of all of the logistics and everyone and all of you and the familiar faces that I'm seeing in, in the audience uh, for what is a great turnout. Uh, this is a work in progress. This is my book project that is coming from my doctoral dissertation that I defended in December 2018. Uh, David Haglund, that's probably one of your profs, was my external on the committee. Um, this is an interesting project. It's, well, <laughs> methodologically at least, because I am basically, competence here is something that we don't really hear about in rational choice framework of arguments. It's mostly using what we call the practice turn in IR, which is the idea of looking at what practitioners do as the unit of analysis instead of other type of outcome variables, right? Uh, it's, norm it's normally post-positivist. It's very interpretivistic and discourse-based analysis. This is not what I am doing. I am shamelessly borrowing concepts that they are using and bringing them in a strategic context, which is nuclear proliferation, what they're never seen, but I'm using them the way we would use it in uh, not regular, but in kind of more mainstream rational choice higher. So I hope I'm not cast any stones. Um, all right, so let's start with a tale of two programs. We have the nuclear prolifer the, the Chinese nuclear program that uh, basically uh, got to the, the best of its speed in 1960 to 1964, and we have Saddam Hussein's Iraqi nuclear program. What is the main difference between these two programs in hindsight? Well, one became nuclear, and it's this China, and the other one, Iraq, got attacked in 1998. Its facilities, its nuclear facilities were attacked in 1998, and again in 2003. Now, at the Q&A, we can dispute the veracity of the 2003 invasion and the intelligence uh, coming around it, but the justification of it remained that it was about WMD. This variation is extremely puzzling according to IR theory. Because we, um, look at, the, I have a list of indicators here, it's a bit small, I'm sorry, that in the literature we usually refer to as reasons for preventive attack under a power shift. What we mean by a power shift is a situation where a large amount of power writ large, either in mobilization capability, GDP, military capabilities, is set to a cure, right? Um, proliferation is a major power shift. Uh, both of these states were autocratic. Both of them were rel relatively weaker uh, than the United States, who was the main state trying to stop their proliferation. They had no great power defenders at that point. Uh, after 1991 made clear that Iraq had no longer the support of the, uh, of the Russians, and China were going, it was in the midst of the Sino-Soviet split, and it was fairly clear that in case of issues, they could not count on the Soviet Union. Uh, and both of them had adversarial foreign policy to the United States, right? Yep, I think, I hope this works. Yes, only Iraq was preventively attacked, right? And as I said, it's, it gets even more puzzling, right? Um, under, uh, so, let me pull back a bit. It gets puzzling because we expect, we expect both of these programs, I'll skip ahead and I'll come back. Uh, we expect both of these programs to be preventively attacked according to the theories that we are, right? That we have. The realist would have argued with us, uh, which is the Deb and Montero argument, that because of the uncertainty of intentions, you're never sure about what an adversary will do in the future, especially as they get more powerful, right? 
And the rational choice argument is bargaining with those nuclear power makes no sense right now because they will get much more powerful in the future. As such, they have no incentive in respecting bargains that they just made now that they are weaker, right? So traditionally, the literature tells us we should see preventive attacks under these situations. Um, and moreover, the Frank Gavin, who is a historian, he used to be at MIT, I don't know where he is right now, have been selling the idea very, uh, very well, I, I, I would say, that the U.S. has always had an homogenous preference for non-proliferation, meaning that it has always, curbing the spread of nuclear weapons has always been very high on the U.S. agenda, right? Uh, always against adversaries and starting from 64 onwards towards al allies as well, going as far as using coercive measures such as, as sanctions, uh, threatening to abandon, them, to, ab to abandon allies, I'm sorry, and so on. So this puzzle is puzzling, but I will make this a bit more puzzling. Let's only take the United States. They interacted with 25 cases of proliferation, right? This, those are states who sought nuclear weapons, right? Out of these 25 cases, we only have 12 attack plans that the US have drafted to stop proliferation. Out of those, and because I'm a qualitative scholar, I'm treating Iraq as a single case of proliferation, and I'm not breaking it into two as my statistician friends would do. We have only one attack. So that means that roughly only 10% of the proliferation that we've seen have been subject to preventive attack as it unfolded. It makes no sense. According to the entire literature about preventive war. So this is a puzzle that we're going to examine together today. Why are preventive attacks against nuclear proliferators, given the rhetoric and the literature that we have telling us how much of an existential threat it is, why is this such a rare event? So I'm basically asking the question, the, the question of variation in reverse. It's not, why do we have variation between some states being attacked and some states not being attacked? The variation is, why is the preventive war an anomaly when we argue that it should not be, right? And here's the argument that I'm going to try and sell you today, okay? Preventive attacks occur, because, okay, because preventive attacks are astronomically costly. There's a variety of, uh, of inter intervening factors that can increase its cost, right? Uh, you can attack a, a nuclear facility and it may escalate. Uh, you may face an adversary that has a very advantageous geography like Iran, for example, like tenfolding your cost of an attack. You can face a country like North Korea that has a military that is designed to make you pay. It's not designed to win, it's designed to make you pay. If you, decide, if you decide to attack them, and so on and so forth. And I'm sure that all of you at the moment, as I'm thinking, are thinking of other reasons why these are costly. So, my argument, based on this, is that occur, uh, attacks occur if and only if there's a credible fear that the nuclear proliferator will be an incompetent nuclear power. And what I mean incompetent is I mean it will be unable to perform coercive diplomacy, namely deterrence, but possibly compellence, in a way that does not risk nuclear escalation. If that's the calculation of a state like the United States, that if that state developed nuclear weapons, the risk of nuclear escalation and nuclear war just increased, we should see an attack. This argument is also counterintuitive because the entire literature tells us that nuclear proliferation should be bad. And we, we, we can argue ad nauseum about this, but it seems that decision makers, at the end of the day, will prefer this minor evil to the evil of a preventive attack. I'll, I'll, I'll unpack this a bit more a little later. Um, I just want to make some kind of scope as to what I'm going to be talking about and then we're going to roll in into the argument. Uh, this is a classic cartoon about nuclear deterrence. 
Um, why I'm choosing to base competence on this idea of deterrence? It's mainly because, uh, as Bernard Brody and many other uh, thinkers have said, with the advent of nuclear weapons, strategic deterrence or nuclear deterrence became the rules of the game. Right? We no longer have militaries to win conflict. We have military. Our goal is now to avert war between nuclear power because the cost of war just increased tenfold or even, even more than that. Right? So it's, it's much more than a strategy. It's really kind of the unwritten rule uh, through which all of nuclear power politics secure. Right? It's kind of the canvas on which it works. And the conventional deterrence also then becomes a lot more important. Um, it becomes the way that you limit escalation in conflict at, uh, at a non-nuclear level, right? Uh, the idea is that uh, you do not expect countries not to have adversarial goals, so you expect some form of conflict, right? Uh, however, you expect this conflict to remain limited. We call this a stability and stability paradox, oftentimes, that you should not see conflict at a nuclear level, but you should see some level of escalation. That is, that's not the best word, but it's the only one I have right now, acceptable kind of escalation, right? However, deterrence is complex. Um, the issue with deterrence is like preventive attack, it's oftentimes in the literature used as gospel. As in, we assume that it works, and we assume that our argument is right, instead of empirically validating it, right? However, I have here three cases, and there's many, many others, I just thought that those were more salient, of cases of deterrence where, despite the fact that the two original state that basically devised the idea came very close to catastrophic escalation, right? Despite the fact that these two states are supposed to be very good at it, they almost got into a situation that became extremely dangerous. On the left-hand side, we have the Berlin uh, airlift or the Berlin crisis. Right? Uh, you have tons of articles around that time. It's basically uh, the, the, the Soviet had blockaded Berlin to, get, to force uh, the Americans to remove the, Deut the, the Deutsche Mark from the market. Uh, and the US, in order to help, were basically sending food by plane within, uh, uh, within uh, Berlin. So if you look at editorials at the time, what you would see often is, will deterrence hold are we at a stage where we should expect a nuclear crisis and so on? And by some indication, chances of escalation were present. We should all recognize this. The XCOM during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, who here watched Fog of War by Robert McNamara? Right? Okay, remember this very chilling scene where he was asked, how close to the brink did we get? And he looks at the camera and he says, this close. Despite the fact that we had two rational individuals, meaning Khrushchev and Kennedy, who did not want nuclear war, we almost got into a situation that escalated. And more than that, because of a break in communication, a uh, Soviet sub almost launched a nuclear weapons as it was facing depth charge to, to force it to surface and uh, the, um, the, 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 the the rank eludes me, uh, believed that they were under attack and that the, 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 the Soviets had decided to go against the uh, US uh, blockade. It was countermined by others in summary. Yet, we came very, very close. And the last one that I have here uh, is Able Archer, which was a NATO exercise um, that was supposed to sim simulate a situation that would escalate to DEFCON 1 where the US would use nuclear weapon in retaliation. The issue is, it was not communicated very well to the, to the Soviets. So what happened? They thought it was a ruse and that the US were, were planning under the, cover, the covert of Able Archer uh, to launch a preventive attack, right? So all of this to say that coercive diplomacy is excessively difficult, right? And that's why I misplaced the roadmap. That's why we need competence, and we'll get back to this in a second. For the rest of the talk, what we'll do is, we'll, uh, well, we just discussed the complexity of deterrence. I will run you through the theory, the logic of competence, and what it matters for my argument. We'll have a few seconds of methodology and data collection. We'll run through the findings, I'll discuss some implication, and I will give you an idea of the state of the book. 
All right. So why does competence matter? Um, any students in the room should know what this is about. Actually, I know I'm 10 years behind on, on, on this. Um, okay, so what is competence? The way that they define it is, it's an amalgamation of skills, knowledge, and aptitudes that makes individuals, organization, or state able, able to perform an activity in an adequate fashion. It has two more caveats for what is important here. Uh, I have two, two more caveats that are important. Competence is a social variable. What it means is it does not exist outside of an audience that dictates what competence is. You cannot be competent and be recognized as competent alone in your bedroom. You could be. You could be the best IT person in the room. But if nobody recognizes you as such, it has no meaning. Right? That also means that there are uh, individuals or states or organizations that are deemed as setting the standard of competence. Right? In this case, and what I would argue, and it's open to debate, we could talk about this afterwards, is that the United States and the Soviet Union are kind of the bearer of what being competent in a course of diplomacy, namely the Terence in our case, is and how other states should behave in particular situations. Okay. Uh, it also means that, so all of this together means that competence is in the eye of the beholder. Right? So the Soviet Union could believe that uh, China would be competent at deterrence, but the United States could believe that it would not be. And both arguments would be valid in the sense that it would create this different policies in the different block at the time. And when we come to the international uh, structure, it would create conflict, right? In my case today, all I'm going to look for is indicators of competence on the US side, okay? Good, so let's run through a, f a list of indicators that when I opened my cases, I looked for, right? In the way that American decision maker would talk about nascent proliferators and how they would behave in the future when it comes to course of diplomacy, right? Whether they would be competent nuclear powers. What were they thinking of? What were they thinking about? The first one is rationality. And I'm using rationality very loosely here in the sense that it's looking at whether they're able to make cost benefits analysis properly. I'm agnostic as whether it's an objective fact of life that we're all rational or that it's a socially constructed idea. It doesn't matter to me. What I'm interested in is how decision makers thought about rationality and how they believed it was important. Right? The second one is the, coming from rationality is an understanding of the ratio of force which is at the heart of deterrence. Right? You should not expect a much weaker country to attack and or push its luck in a situation where they're outgunned, outmaneuvered, and deemed to lose, right? Relatively speaking. At least when this is observed, it plays into a positive idea about competence. Now we can disagree whether it's a good indicator or not, but that's the one the United States has used often enough. The other one is the understanding of the rules. How well do you understand deterrence? How well do you understand the right amount of threats to get what you want? The right amount of reassurance that you need to give, right? Reassurance here is solely uh, defined as if you, do, if you comply, I will not punch you in the face. That's all reassurance is. It's basically you're assuring the other that the threat will be removed upon uh, if, if you acquiesce, right? And the other one is promises, right? In a bargaining situation, you'll also have a mix of the three. But how do you know when to push? How do you know when not to push? And so on and so forth is all part of this. The other one is the ability to reestablish a terence. Because the idea is most conflict begin when the terence fail. But throughout the conflict, there will be instances where you try to reestablish the terence. So that to either give a reprieve or stop hostilities before we can move to negotiation. This is seen as something that is particularly uh, competent. And the other one is the ability to learn. As new technology uh, uh, arrive, as new ways of doing things arrive, you wanna be able to reassess how the rules are made, how the rules are played, and how they're actuated. 
Think about all of the arms control negotiation that we've seen. Those were really learning places for deterrence. Uh, US and Soviet decision makers sat down together, re discussed what worked and what did not, like technology-wise, for example. That's why the INF was signed and we removed intermediate range nuclear weapons. It was thought that they were destabilizing for deterrence, right? So we just all, we just, they, they agreed to get them off the table, for example. It's also moments that you can get to know each other and basically uh, discuss. And all of these, and the caveat to all of this is that you need communication. This only happens if you have uh, decent diplomatic channels open between states to be able to explain all of this, right? If you're closed off, it can work, right? You can look and say, hey, yeah, that's good, but it's kind of the process that works a bit better if you're able to explain it, most of the time. Method of case selection. Um, what I will present to you today is my, the Chinese case and the Iraqi case. Right? The book has nine in total, and I have an experimental design in it uh, to test whether my argument about competence actually works in the population and, and how individuals form groups and not based on how they're good at deterrence. I designed a little game to make that work. We can talk about this a bit more. Uh, I'm not going to present that here today. I'm still, the, the, sir, the game is still being played as we speak. Um, I relied as much as I could on archival documents. Uh, I visited four presidential libraries myself, uh, <coughs> and I availed to uh, myself of all of the resources that they now have online. Uh, I went to the Kennedy Library, Carter, Johnson, and Re Reagan. Uh, fantastic places if you have a chance to go. Uh, I went to the U.S. National Archives in Washington, D.C., and I used the foreign, uh, the FRUS, the Office of the Historian Books on Foreign Policy Archives that they put out, which is a curated uh, se selection of important memos and so on from, the pre from presidencies over a variety of topics. Right? When these were insufficient, uh, I relied on interviews. Now, I know that interviews are not as good as archives, uh, we have a tendency to make ourselves look better in hindsight. Uh, however, when you take the, with the limited archival documents that I found in the most recent cases, the secondary literature and the interviews, I'm kind of able to triangulate something that gets me a bit closer to declassified documents from the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, for example. And most of what I did was process tracing uh, in the cases. So the way I treated all of my cases is independent of each other uh, to see if my argument flows through it. And afterwards, I use them in a comparative fashion to see if I can uh, argue an argument across cases, right? And generalize uh, the argument that I'm trying to make about competence and terrorists. So just to recap, attacks occur if and only if you'll be deemed completely incompetent as a nuclear power. Competent here is how competent at deterrence and or coercive diplomacy you'll be. Competence act a little bit like a commitment <coughs> mechanism. Right? If you're able to play by the rules right, we can trust that you'll be responsible and decent in the future. Right? The way that we will look at sunk costs or material commitment as a way to follow through on bargains. Right? Uh, an example of a material commitment, uh, I'll probably date myself, but Footloose, the movie? Yes. Anyone remember Footloose? Right? Um, how did Kevin Bacon commit himself to the outcome on the tractor to impress the ladies? He got his shoe tied to the gas pedal and couldn't get out of the tractor and signaled that he couldn't get out of the tractor. He actually tried to get out of the tractor a few times. This is material commitment. He's basically telling his audience, which is, the other tug in the other tractor, I can't, I can't leave. I'm physically tied to this. You're, you have the last chance of leaving this situation. What I'm arguing here is that we can have a very similar mechanism, but if you're about following properly and competently the rules. Right. Good. Let's start with the case of China. This is the Lam Nur Desert where the Chinese nuclear test uh, took place I think it was October 16, 1964, but I could be off a day or two. All right, so how did the case unfold? Well, from the get-go, we have a, 
how am I doing for time? Uh, wow. Pretty good? Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Flexibility. No, but I, I'm a greedy individual. I want as much comment as I can, so I'm going to keep that tidy at 35, 40 minutes. Um, we have a president of the United States that is fairly adamant that nuclear proliferation is a problem and that it will lead to more insecurity than security. And we also have, and you're, I'll read it with you, you know, it wouldn't be too hard if we could somehow get kind of an anonymous airplane to go over there meaning Chinese nuclear facilities, take out their facilities, they've only got a couple and maybe we could do it, or maybe the Soviet Union could do it, rather than face the threat of China with nuclear weapons. There's also the idea here that John F. Kennedy thought that it was a very easy process. Right? So, an alternative explanation that we hear often is that we don't see preventive attacks, not because of my argument of competence, but it's just because they're infeasible. Well, in this case, we have a clear indication that they believe that it was. Right? Uh, and many in this close circle thought that China was going to be more aggressive with the bomb. Right? They would be emboldened to go and get a lot more of territory. And the number one issue that came back a few times in the document was Taiwan. What do we do if China decides when they get the bomb to invade Taiwan? They're going to place us in a very difficult situation. And what if they don't stop at Taiwan? And so on. Right? However, Pervading the documents are two things. First, they are signaled from the Chinese leadership that they would not expand, that they would not be more adventuristic, and that their foreign policy would not change drastically. And now at first they start to sell it on an ideological way that socialism uh, prohibits them from uh, using wars of expansion and so on. Right? It doesn't, this ideology doesn't really matter for the United States. What they're hearing is, <coughs> The Chinese want the bomb for deterrence and to be a, a bit more independent in that foreign policy. How likely is this? And the second thing that comes up often is the cost of the attack. Not in terms of norms, not in terms of, uh, this is horrible, we cannot provoke a war like this, but more in a sense that politically it would look bad, first. Second, it can escalate in ways that we're not intending. Um, and more importantly, the best way to take care of all of this would be using nuclear weapons, which we're not really sure we want to do at this point. Curtis LeMay was a very big fan of this idea, using nuclear weapons to disarm the Chinese in one swift move. Right? So this is all there. Well, so what happens when this happens? Then you have paper, some, a ton of agency arguing for and against what we should do. Should we allow the... Uh, should we allow China to become nuclear or should we not, right? And I will run you through a few slides of archive. It's very minimal, but for, but for the time being, that kind of exemplify the thinking around how China would be a competent nuclear actor in the future. This is a 1961 assessment from the Air Force that was found in the National Intelligence Estimate. Um, and I've boldened what I think is most important, but. The communist China almost certainly does not intend to attempt to open military conquest of any Far Eastern country during the period of this estimate. However, it's believed that to secure some of their interests, namely uh, defending communist interests in North Vietnam and North Korea, they would probably be a bit more aggressive. But now we're three years out, right? We're 1961. We're three years out of the actual detonation. So we have some time. This is Assistant Parson. He was Assistant Secretary of State for Foreign Eastern Affairs uh, in a memo that he sent to Secretary of State Rusk, basically arguing that the talks have apparently acted as a partial damper in Chinese communist military action in Taiwan. So here they're referring to the Taiwan Strait Crisis and how unexpectedly, despite the fact that the Chinese had, had initiated the hostilities, the minute that they realized it was no longer their advantage to push and that it would cost too much, they've decided to retreat and they were the first one to open the door to negotiations. Right? So here we have a good instant of competence. Against unfavorable odds, they could have escalated more, which if they have nuclear weapon poses a big problem. But in this case, they cut their losses and they decided, let's see what diplomacy can give us, right? After having failed to gain Khmer and Khmer, 
through its attack of August, September 1958, Pepin then took the initiative of proposing that the meetings be resumed. Right? And during the meetings, they did not perform any other military action, which was well received from the Americans. Another estimate, now in 1963, by the intelligence community. Right? China's military leaders would recognize their limited capabilities and not alter the real power balance among the major states. What they're referring to here is let's assume that China is now nuclear, they have a small arsenal, how would their thinking change? How do we expect them to behave? And the way that we expect them to behave is here, the following, according to the Americans. Uh, they would recognize that they remain unable to I either to remove or neutralize a U.S. presence in Asia and would not become willing to take significant greater military risk. This signals a cautious power, and it signals a power that understands the ratio of forces not being in its favor at that particular moment, even if they get nuclear weapons. Right? Finally, this is perhaps... This, okay, this was a controversial paper. Robert H. Johnson was a, 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 an aide within the, uh, the State Department, and he wrote two papers that really tried to analyze how China would behave with nuclear weapons in the future. Now, the first version was so hated that they commissioned another one. Uh, they, they did not want to circulate the one that was. So what I'm quoting here is from the second version of the paper. Uh, what I did not quote here is how important it was for Johnson that he, in, the, in the Indian Sino War that had taken place, I think, that had, a year prior, 1962, I think, um, the Chinese had agreed to the ceasefire, the pullback, and had not retaliated against the Indian Army, despite its loss. That had impressed Johnson. And coming from this backdrop, he went and he argued this here. Chinese prudence and the use of military force and forces conclusion emerging from military logic, the military logic that he argued for the Indio, in, in, Sino Indian War. The basic military pro problems we will face are likely to be much like those we face now military probing operations designed to test the level of US commitment and response. This year's particular. No, what I just done? Okay. Um, I would be lost without those slides. Um, what's important here is this. So the idea behind deterrence and coercive diplomacy is always a question of resolve. How determined are you to see your outcome? And for deterrence to work, you're always trying to manipulate the resolve of another. So what Johnson is arguing here, so yeah, of course the Chinese are going to prod us and push us and see how determined we are and how committed to certain outcomes we are. But if we are committed, if we signal commitment, they should not push back because they're a cautious power that understand deterrence and they would not risk the military loss that comes with it. Uh, and th this is, uh, Similar argument in the same uh, moment in time, this time from the desk of the National Security Council. It was Robert du penned by Robert W. Cromer that argued that the consensus was that the Chinese would remain basically cautious of the overuse of force even after they acquired a few nukes. First use by them would be highly unlikely, which the first use in a crisis was still a major issue at the time. Uh, instead, they would see their nuclear weapons as deterrents to escalation by us. So now we're starting to see the entire idea of a dangerous China with the bomb, of a more adventuristic Chinese with the bomb, is slowly going away. And we're buying the initial messages from the Chinese that they want the bomb for deterrent purposes, not to be more aggressive. Uh, now, this is not to say that China would not remain an adversary and that conflicts is going to be taken entirely off the table. It just means that we can kind of be certain that they will remain limited over particular interests. Right? This is an interesting part of the whole process. This is, John F. Kennedy thought that he could rope in the Soviet Union into jointly attacking China because of the Sino-Soviet split. The main response that came from the Russian is basically reassert 
the competency of the Chinese in the future by selling the competency of US allies. Basically arguing, why do you care about the Chinese? The French nuclearized and nothing changed. Why? Because they're a decent military power. There's absolutely no difference between the French and the Chinese. The only difference is that they're not on your side. But really, nothing is going to change. They'll be as cautious as they used to be. Uh, and Khrushchev, Khrushchev basically argued, said that we won't do anything either way. We're not going to help you, but we're not really going to hinder anyway. Right? Uh, but this, this went away. John F. Kennedy, unfortunately, was assassinated in November 22nd, I think, 1963. Uh, 1960, yeah, 1963. Uh, and Johnson took uh, the presidency. And really, I'm, I'm using this slide because it's encompassing the same kind of thinking, but in the Johnson era. And it comes uh, with the nose to the detonation. I forgot to put the date, but I think it's a month before the Chinese detonate their first bomb. Uh, basically, it's a long, long one, but basically arguing. Communist China military policy has always been about caution in the face of superior power. Its decline of relative effectiveness of its military and weapons, it does not make them more likely to resort to nuclear weapon. It just makes them more cautious. And once they get the bomb, they'll be additionally cautious anyway. So the chances of retaliation in conflict, uh, we can't think of a way under which they'll use nuclear weapons first. And then 1964 happens, October 16, the Chinese get the bomb, pledge no first use. Iraq is a completely different story. Um, this is the Osirak reactor that Israel attacked in 1981 that is not rebuilt and is a pile of rubble at this time of this photo. I, I'm, I'm not sure when that photo was uh, taken. The story is completely different. Uh, although it's fairly clear that Hussein wanted nuclear weapons for the terrorist purposes, and kind of let it filter in track two diplomacy a few times, he went at this as obfuscated as possible. Now, it is not particularly uh, surprising given that after the Chinese, most program became covert anyway, right? The Indian peaceful detonation 74 and so on all became covert and it became part of the game. This is uh, George W. Bush. It's in the State of the Union address in 2008, but it's a much better picture than what I found for 2002, so I used that one. Uh, basically arguing that Iraq with a bomb is particularly problematic. Why? Because they have a history of recklessness. They have a history of arming terrorists. Uh, Saddam had used proxy terrorists in 1991. Uh, now. The link that was drawn to Al-Qaeda was excessive. I'm not a specialist in terrorism, but to me it was very tedious uh, at best. But the fear was still present because he'd done it in 1991, right? Uh, they, had at they had attacked US allies during the Gulf War. They had launched rocket at Saudi Arabia and Israel. And they were feared that they would transfer nuclear um, goods to other countries. There's also the underlying problem that Iraq had not been deterred in 91 and had not been compelled either. And despite superior forces and clear signal from the US that they would get them out of Kuwait, he decided to try his luck nonetheless. This is the document that we still talk about today, which is the 2002 National Intelligence Estimate as to the capabilities of Hussein. This, a little bit of context, right after 1991, uh, resolution 687 was put forward to disarm Saddam and any, anything that he had coming, chemical or nuclear weapons wise, right? He shirked that commitment as much as he could uh, to the point where in 1998 he kicked out IAEA inspectors out of the country and because of this the US and the UK decided to attack what they believe was nuclear facilities because 1991 had been a big surprise. Nobody knew how far along on chemical nuclear programs the Iraqis were. They were much more advanced along that track. That was expected at the time. They were nowhere near detonation, but still, it, it was still a surprise. So 1998 occurred. You have no longer any eyes on the ground. 9-11 happened, compound security threats and so on. And now you're in 2002 and you're looking at uh, the threats around yourself and the issue of WMD comes back and this is the estimate that we got, uh, basically arguing 
that Iraq still had weapons of mass, continued to develop weapons of mass destruction, and I think the most important lines are in bold. If left unchecked, we probably will have nuclear weapons during this decade. We judge that we're seeing only a portion of Iraq's WMD efforts owing to Baghdad's vigorous denial and deception of efforts. And in the view of most intelligence agencies, we believe that Iraq is developing weapons of mass destruction. Condoleezza Rice in her memoir exemplified this a little bit more, right? Uh, the line starts about the fact that Saddam might aid terrorism uh, against the US, probably not giving them weapons of mass destruction, but nonetheless, he had, however, established a pattern of recklessness, particularly in failing to anticipate the international community's strong response to his 1990 invasion of Kuwait and his 1993 attempt to assassinate former President George H.W. Uh, Bush. And below is kind of the fear that they may give a bomb to uh, uh, extremists that could detonate that in a U.S. city. This is far-fetched, but it was still uh, a fear at the time. This is a very terrible picture of Colin Powell at the UN, who basically put uh, the final nail in the coffin of Iraq, re-ashing re everything that we've heard up until then, but also arguing that nuclearization was much closer than we expected, that they already had materials, that we had seen this material, right? So throughout this story, and this case is uh, mostly still in the making. I'm conducting uh, like 15 interviews in the next two weeks to finish this. That's why it's a bit shorter than the, uh, the Chinese case, but it is being promising in the sense that a lot of what I'm arguing is coming out in the interview. We did not trust the Iraqi with nuclear weapons. We believed that he would have gotten us in a situation where deterrence would not have worked and would have been faced with, okay, but are we really going to escalate with a nuclear power? And will we have a choice to do it, right? So the fear of nuclear escalation and war with Iraq was present in most of the discussion that I had. Um, I'm supposed to speak with Condoleezza Rice next week. I'm very excited. Uh, it's crazy what the Yale.edu email gets me that my McGill.ca account didn't give me back then. <laughs> Funny. Uh, but some conclusions from all of this. Um, implications. The role of competence. I do think that when we talk about deterrence, we've never really thought about whether being good at it matters. And I went, I went about it in a very roundabout way of using it as kind of a past action deal to try to determine if future action are going to follow a, what we call a responsible or competent fashion. But I think this makes it hard for me to do so. And if I'm convincing you, then I, ma I made a very good case that, that competence at coercive diplomacy is important. And I'll be able to continue discussing this in more uh, uh, venues, namely in crisis situation where you actually threaten uh, the deterrence. The other one is nuclearization, it doesn't change much. As much as the decision makers will tell us that it do, when you look at the documents, when you look at how they talk about this, when they have two unpalatable situations, they'll usually defer to no attack if the state is deemed to be a competent proliferator, meaning that this whole idea that it's the number one priority of the United States is probably stretched a little bit. We should maybe reassess how that actually worked. But also, uh, yes. Oh, that's inverted. Uh, and the other one is I think we need to put a lot more emphasis into this argument about symmetry and asymmetry of interest. When we read about preventive attacks and preventive war, we always read about them as if they are the interests at both sides are symmetrical, meaning that both states care about the issue the same way. But that's not true. A proliferator that gets a minute away from the bomb, that becomes their number one priority. The United States has a million priorities at the same time. Think about 2006. North Korea is about to detonate a bomb, we have intelligence. What do we do? Well, we have North Korea, we have Afghanistan, and we have Iraq to deal with. Right? Uh, and I just wanted to give you, a very, in closing, a very quick uh, idea of uh, the book chapter. If we can come back to this. Chapter, I presented you chapter two, chapter five a little bit, and then chapter seven. The rest are all empirical chapters on other cases and so on. We, we can talk about this. Uh, 
I have other paper I'm circulating if you're interested. We can talk about this in the Q&A that all fit these teams. Thank you very much. Uh, it was great to have you. I'm sorry I went two minutes overboard, but thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, are there questions? Thomas. As always, thank you ever so much. That was a really fascinating talk. Uh, so I'll, I'll give the first possibly um, easy question, hopefully, for you to be able to respond to. Um, I'd like a, a little bit more information, if you wouldn't mind, particularly thinking about um, the, the difference in interest between um, China and the US and, and the US and Iraq, and just how your theory differs from kind of the, the, the standard balance of threats theory and understanding that in the first case with China, they just didn't see China as a, as a threat to them, whereas in Iraq, there was a genuine threat. Mm -hmm. Does that theme follow through? Um, it does. There are similarities with balance of threat. Uh, although, the caveat, let's start with a not so nice caveat. I went with the dominant literature on power shift these days, which is the bargaining theory of war, that don't really look at threats, but they look at commitment, and that's what I kind of attacked. But, yes, there's a relationship to threat, but I think that my, my argument adds to this a little bit. In the case of China, uh, I, I, I couldn't show you as much as I wanted, but there's very, uh, especially in the beginning, there's this big idea uh, that they are a threat. And it is problematic that they're nuclearizing. And we could get into a very difficult situation. Uh, and, uh, and also in the Johnson years, there's a lot of debate as to how dangerous they were. But this was also usually not either debunked or made less salient by this argument that they would be a competent nuclear power, right? Which we don't have in the case of Iraq. No one is trying to make the case that Iraq will be a competent nuclear power. As such, the threat level skyrocket. In the other one, we had discussion about how threatening they were, but we also had discussion that, well, you know what? They've been cautious. We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be that scared about this, and the bomb is not going to make them worse. So it's fine. So threat is conditioned, in this case, on the level of competence. That's what I'd say. Uh, would you consider the Soviet Union a competent nuclear power? I would. would. I would. Um, what, okay, you seem to not think that they are. Why? I'm just saying one of your examples was the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought the world closest to, to the brink. Yes. So why wouldn't they consider China to be a future possibility, so short-sighted? Sure. Um, no. So uh, I have a chapter on the Soviet Union that I, I, I didn't present here. Uh, it's, it's, it's a weird case. I'll, I'll get to this uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, I just want to, provide, to, to preface it. It's a weird case in the sense that the U.S. detection capabilities were not as good as they are today. So the U.S. were actually surprised when the Soviet detonated their first nuclear weapon. They expected it six months, a year later. And that was a problem. But uh, we have three moments where they thought about preventively attacking them, 46, 47, and 48. Uh, and one of the arguments made to defuse that situation was that, uh, yes, they will be expansionists. Yes, if we give them the chance and we're not as committed as we should be, they would probably try to take some of the interest, influence, or uh, territory that we want. However, if we're firm and so on, they'll get that and they'll back up, right? So because of this, they're deemed competent. But I think the Cuban Missile Crisis works inside of it in the sense that you, I can think that you're competent, but I can also see that we can make mistake in a situation that, as Thomas Schelling is called, is a contest in risk taking, right? And just because of this, because, for, because deterrence is not clear, deterrence is not, we know what deterrence is. What, when, when you sit down and you think about it, it's, uh, yeah, that makes sense. But then when you start to think about it in a particular situation, it's not clear how it should be actuated. It's not clear how much threat, how much reassurance, how much promise to give and so on. So while it's you, it's theory is clear, it's used in particular situation is not. And in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, it happened. But at the onset, we had a failure deterrence. They brought missiles to Cuba against the US's argument that they, uh, that they would protect their backyard and so on. But eventually, deterrence was 
kind of uh, reestablished with the blockade and so on. Uh, everybody played this kind of well. The US left their calm unencrypted so that the Soviets could read into them and basically figure out that when some boats were leaving, it was for relief and not in this and that. So they played that fairly well. But so yes, long story short, there's a difference between uh, mistakes in, in doing it, but still, I mean, you have a car mechanic, he makes mistakes sometimes. He's still pretty good. I mean, mine is very good, but he botched my brake jobs last time. I still recommend it. I still think he's competent, but, you know. So I, I would argue this in the case of the missile Cuban crisis. Steve, um, I just had a question for you on your um, deference to no attack, no one and 12. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you considered, um, as we go along, I know Warfare starts to incorporate other things like cyber um, to deter uh, nuclearization or proliferation, whether or not you consider, you consider things like Stuxnet or coordination of attacks, not proxy, but where Israel's taken lethal action, uh, but it's obviously coordinated with U.S. interest, and whether or not those two things, proxy and things like cyber or space, uh, get brought into it because it could be considered an attack just with a different means. It could be. Um, a terrible answer and an attempt as, at a good one. Uh, but because it's a very good question, I, and I wrestled with it in my Iran case myself. Um, the terrible answer is I'm trying to, bl to put myself in the actual theories that have been devised to explain preventive wars. And what they are are a physical military attack against a country. So according to this, yes, no, it's not a preventive attack. However, what I think it's interesting is it brings into perspective the fact that it's a bit more complex than it is. I would probably, I mean, Stuxnet was a problem, but I would not say that it was as debilitating as if the U.S. had been able to actually bomb the facilities. I can't remember how many uh, centrifuge basically were destroyed with the, the virus. I think it was three, if I remember correctly. It's a pain. Is this really on the scale of preventative attack? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. However, it, interestingly enough, it reduces the cost of attack, mm -hmm. but in a way that increases the chance that we won't see attack under similar circumstances. I would probably be willing to roll it into the, we always expect attacks, but we don't because we have other means. But I, the real answer is I need to sit down and think a little bit more closely how I want to deal with cyber in the future. Because I'm and we can talk about this because I'm really not sure how much it affects what I'm trying to argue. Oh. Just a quick question. You gave the example of Iraq, um, but Iraq happened when <coughs> Iran was developing its weapon and making serious threats against Israel. Why not Iran? What's the, the difference between the two? Oh, the attack? Um, attack Iraq, but not Iran. Um, so the problem we have with Iran is that we have our nose to it. There's not that many documents. Now, from what I know, Israel had put something like $2.4 million in a slush fund to plan an attack against the Irani. They went to the Americans a few times to get the go-ahead to do it and they, very, they came very close to. Uh, my feeling is that we would have seen an attack, and the why not is that the Irani government was open to, the to, to give the concession to the Obama administration that Obama wanted to see to relieve sanction and basically became the Iran nuclear deal. But if Iran had rejected the deal, I think we would have seen an attack. I think, because especially from Israel's perspective, Iran would have been a completely incompetent power in the sense that they would have probably ended up in a situation where escalation was kind of likely. Whether it's objective or not, I, it's, a, it's not the answer you probably want, but it's, uh, we did not have enough time to see the theory actually actualize. There is a different time scale in there, but it would be interesting to explore yeah. what in fact was going on in terms of the different um, situations. Um, there are lots of factors that go into both. Oh, sure, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, those are very complex, and the complexity is compounded by the fact that we're right there. 
It's easy for me to talk about the Soviet Union, China, and India because these documents are now available. We can look into the, the thinking and what almost came. Here, it's hearsay, it's pundits in the media, it's interviews of people trying to make themselves look good. It's not always uh, ideal. Could I take the, uh, uh, the last question? And I, I can't remember whether or not Pakistan was uh, in your chapter summary. But let me ask you about Pakistan and pose the same question about competence and incompetence. If, in fact, competence is, is uh, a, a key, could Pakistan really be considered a competent? Uh, can you say something about yep. Pakistan and its nuclear weapons? Yeah, Pakistan is in the chapter. Uh, it was also part of the, of the dissertation. It's a three-part answer. The first part is the Carter administration, uh, it's not clear how competent they saw the Pakistani, but they, st they drafted a preventive attack plan against Pakistan. But now, when Reagan came into power, what else happened? Well, the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan. Now, Pakistan becomes a strategic, an important strategic partner to the United States. Um, it's so to be entirely honest, this is probably the case where my theory is the weakest in the sense that the, the trade-off that the Reagan made at the time were a lot more predicated on its need of Pakistan in Afghanistan than the fact that they wanted them to be nuclear. Uh, it fits into my argument that uh, proliferation is not always the number one objective. In this case, they had another one. However, there's documents here and there saying, hey, now we're working with them. And what is interesting is that they're changing their military doctrine. They're going more towards a deterrent posture against India. They seem to be buying the capability that is adequate to this, to this endeavor. Um, probably that them nuclear is not going to be as big of a deal. However, that's probably the most contested of the time where you have a significant portion of the intelligence community that is really not happy with that answer. You have, I can't remember, I think it's Har, uh, Avril, not Avril Ehrman. Uh, I can't remember the name of the gentleman that sent a very angry memo saying, if we do nothing against Pakistan, we're basically saying, hey, nuclearize, business as usual. Yet, they did not. And afterwards, the issue starts afterwards, right? The 1991 crisis. Uh, where India almost attacked Pakistan preventively and so on. So I would say that the argument of competence went like this. It's not, yeah, probably we need them, we can kind of live with that. And then 1991, yeah, no. Comes back a little bit, uh, Afghanistan happens, and, and you know very well from your book, that goes down again in the eye of the United States. So Pakistan is, is probably my weakest case. On that note, on the weak note, uh, <laughs> please join me uh, in uh, thanking Jean-Francois for a really uh, interesting presentation. Uh, thank and, you very much. Uh, on behalf of the oh, center, a, thank you uh, so much. A little me uh, memento. Oh, this thank is beautiful. You. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. This is very nice. And we'll, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. That was appreciated.